first I will uh, give a speech to yeah. Dr. Honka Pohja. Can I just make two responses? There were some reasonable points here, but, but one thing, the, why the straw man to the students? Well, in physics teaching, you don't start physics one with quantum mechanics. I think you start with classical mechanics, right? I, I believe that, so I think that should tell you why, why you start with simple models. Uh, the idea that you Which demand very complicated <laughs> stuff right away gets you nowhere if there's no background. But let's get to this idea of non-equilibrium and, and, and this claim that there is, there is no link to the society. I used to teach general equilibrium theory. I used to teach various aspects of it also, sometimes from macro point. I start with, you know, it's not just the individual, it's also the economic environment in here the opera. What kind of market situation is it? Is it perfect competition? Is it a game theoretic situation, etc.? You have to make these two. That second half, the economic environment, is one which you also have to specify. You don't just start say, I start with the individual. You don't get anywhere unless you tell that what is the economic environment he's operating in. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I think, is again misrepresentation. Of course, this, you know, if you take simple DSG models, the economic environment is very simple. Yes, but it's, there is, the environment is still there. So the society, whatever, and you, you feel free to make an alternative environment. So you agree that economic, economic modeling should be done through representative agents? No. No, no you don't? No. Not you don't? No, I don't. I, I, but, but okay. I, you know, it, I got but, my answer. But, some, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, I've, I've used representative sometimes agents. Sometimes or never. As you know, as you know I've, I've used it sometimes. But even if I say that agents are, for simplification, assumed to be identical. For example, in some of the papers, I say that they don't know them, uh, that it is different agents, that they are identical. You see, the information assumption is, is also important. So that's still not going to change anything. It, I mean, it will. I can tell you, it will. Well... You know, if it, knowledge that everybody is identical makes a big difference to not knowing it, even if, in fact, we got two identical individuals. If they don't know it while they go, go and do their purchases in the markets and so forth, that, that, that makes a big difference. It can make, well, but, but let's okay. not get into the details. So that is, that's obviously the important thing. Uh, but okay. you don't obviously, you know, we also start, you know, the, I admit that, you know, obviously you want to do alternative approaches and we don't, you don't always start from the individual. But the individual, you know, as I said, it, you always have to specify what kind of environment are we in if you're doing carefully presenting the theory. And that, that, that again, I, you know, it should be granted. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's have one question from the audience. Uh, okay, few. you, you're the first one. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'm Tuomas Malinen from the Discipline of Economics at the University of Helsinki, and uh, I don't know if you have actually a question, I have a few comments. Uh, I've been doing research in economics, growth, uh, income inequality and crisis for about six years. And they, uh, for the last two years I have been teaching a course on development economics. So I'm going to give you a, um, like a short uh, few things that you can draw out of like 200 years of uh, economic development. First, if you look at the histories of like G of United States for 200 years, um, uh, let's say Finland for 120 years, there seems, to, there seems to be a steady state growth, which is just, you know, thrown out of the balance um, for some exogenous shocks like wars and financial crisis, etc. And some countries have failed on this growth, and the reasons have been, well, there have been several, like a, uh, civil wars, bad institutions, bad rulers, corruption, overinvestment, and socialism. So, some have grown and some have not. And, for example, like China started to grow when it allowed people to own uh, the profits they get from the firms. So, the basic message is that there is a uh, kind of a steady state growth which you say there is not, and the free market principle works. Well, it works in your opinion. For millions of people all over the world, it's an absolute failure. So, <laughs> no, but if you like, give like 50 years, and then we look at this section of like history, it will be probably a blimp in the linear growth path. Well, yeah, but what I can say about this is that those people living in feudalism never thought that there would be another system just like 
some economists living now think that capitalism is eternal, and it's not. And just like the feudal lords were dismantled and replaced by, by democracy and this new system, this system is going to change one day as well. So the steady state, the historians will actually evaluate much better than we, we are evaluating, because those people living in feudalism might be, th some, some people might be thinking they are, it's, it's a pretty good system as well, actually. So that's, I mean, the steady state growth is, is, is not, does not show anything about the success of capitalism at all, really. That's not a sign of anything, at least in my opinion. Laurie, and then uh, I, will... uh, I, and I I think that basically uh, saying that we would have some kind of a steady state is, is not actually, you can't really debunk the heterodox arguments from that basis in the sense that you could of course say that, say, if you think, for example, the Western European economies from the 1980s onwards, we can we can then see that the uh, unemployment rate started to, uh, started to rise quite dramatically uh, compared to the previous decades from, uh, for, let's say, from the, from the end of 1970 onwards and so on and so forth and and then we have had then we basically uh, like achieved a new kind of a steady state a steady state where we you where we have got you gotten used to say six to eight percent levels of unemployment and used and before that we had a steady state of, of zero unemployment so so the question is that of course we can have these kinds of parts because the because we have these different kinds of path dependencies which are constructed uh, upon the institutional settings that we have uh, at, uh, at different points in time, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that some kind of a particular uh, growth theory, for example, a neoclassical growth theory would be, uh, would, would be better than, say, post-Keynesian or so on and so forth. Okay, and now a question? If possible, can I really quickly comment on that as well? Um, I, I readily recommend to you, sir, in terms of economic policy, reading the work by Ha Jun Chang. He works at Cambridge University. Um, he has a concept of kicking away the ladder, um, which talks about how all of the major economic powers actually grew with immense use of state power and public investment. And only once they had grown sufficiently to dominate the markets, they started preaching the the dogma of free markets, but that's just in terms of economic policy. When it comes to the success of capitalism, um, I think the, well, the, <laughs> the amount of crises that we have had is one example of the wonderful stability that capitalism produces, and also this thing called climate change um, is not too good of a thing. Um, <laughs> and, well, I mean, if you think of, a, think of an economic system that depends on growth and consumption of, of our natural resources. I think that makes you kind of wonder whether capitalism is absolutely the best option that we we have. So I recommend that you look at those. Um, also the growth of inequality. Um, the de definition of success in terms of growth alone to me seems a bit strange we're, when we, we're considering the impact of inequality on on human beings. I mean, 50% of our of the global population live in absolute poverty. So, so your definition of success in terms of growth to me seems a bit, well, strange. Um, but yeah, I had a question to, um, well, two questions. I'm going to try and be quick. Um, to Honga Pohya, your understanding of, um, you said that we shouldn't have our philosophical views impact our understanding of economics. But the, the proposition that we should first start with agents um, to understand the economic world or the world around us is an extreme philosophical position to take with regard to agency versus structure. I mean, that was my first lecture in politics. So, so I would like to understand your, your definition of philosophical and also your understanding of political. Because to me, um, when econ economists make... Um, um, prescriptions on how we should allocate resources, that to me is a fundamentally political question. And the pretense that this is somehow not political is, is strange. But, oh, but I just want to know what your definition of political there is. Um, and then lastly, um, to Mr. Um, Yilmaz, I hope I'm pronouncing yeah, that correct. okay. Um, I was wondering, because you said that you often get shouted down for being called a commie or something. What is your um, view on the strange dichotomy that you still, like, 
when I critique capitalism, I get that as well, but I mean, surely people must know that there are different economic systems. Um, and also, I was wondering if, if you are like familiar with the work of Robin Hachnell and Michael Albert on um, participatory democracy and uh, participatory economics and, and ecological markets and, and your view on, on the development of solidarity economy in, in, some, in some states in relation to the crisis. Thank you. Okay, Hanka Pohe, please. Should I? Uh, uh, I'm, yes. I'm not quite sure if I got all of it, but this question about the individual versus structure. Yeah. You know, if I approach some particular problem, economic problem, I will, you know, you know, I, I will, I will, I will start. You know, what is the overall structure of this problem? What is my interest there? I, when I, then I say that okay, let's look at the individual. Suppose it's a, it's about savings behavior, <coughs> household savings behavior, or household labor supply behavior. I will start with the structure. I will say that, okay, this, this particular family or individual, if it's individual, he lives in this kind of situation, these kinds of markets, these kinds of institutions he faces, and then he has his own objectives, his or her own objectives. And it's the interaction of that structure and the objectives with which you then start to analyze. analyze. There is always a structure. The claim that there is just an agent is, is, is a strange one. Of course, if it's a different problem, if it's an aggregate problem, you know, if it's, a, if it's a, say, the international economy, the international financial system, I'm not going to start with every individual bank or every individual company or, or, or asset market and so forth. You will have to do something. But there is, you know, but there, you know, but there is always a structure there that you start with. So this claim that it's always individual and no structure, I, th I find it absurd. Sorry? I, I, mean, do you agree that there's a that I am taking a philosophical system, position, but, but the claim that I'm saying that I just care about agents is, is rubbish. Yeah. I always start with the structure. If you, if you had taken my course in microeconomic theory, I would always start with the structure. This is the economic environment, these kinds of markets we assume, or, or possibly other institutions, possibly taxes, whatever. That's, 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 you have to remember, even though you're saying, and then obviously the individual can be for some questions, going on the individual, starting there is fine. On other questions, you have to start with much higher up. Okay, thank you. And then Devrim? No, I'll, I'll answer very briefly. Uh, about, about that question, whether or not people are aware that there are alternative systems, systems I'm not so sure if people are aware of it, because uh, as you've just said, uh, my post-crisis economic society students, when they asked for modules on Marxism, some lecturers in the department and economics lecturers, I stress this, these people are supposed to be teaching economics. When they asked for modules on Marxism, the answer they got was, was North Korea. Yeah? Like, this is the level of intellectual depth you're talking to. Yeah? This is so just to give you the level of depth of the intellectuals that you're trying to start a dialogue. I had a conversation there, basically a hypothetical conversation in my slides. I didn't have time to go through this, but I had a hypothetical conversation between a mainstream and a heterodox economist. And you always hit this wall when you're discussing with, these, with, with the mainstreamers, simply because these, these are mainly the products of the education system that the students are criticizing. So they are as ignorant and as illiterate as, as you can actually, you can possibly imagine about these things. Like it's worse than you can possibly imagine probably because an economics lecturer talking about North Korea when you say, talk about Marxism is like, leaves no words really to, I mean, you don't even want to continue with the discussion because it just puts you off this. And for, on the other subject, I wanted to talk about this, but I had no time. One of the main successes of mainstream economics is to present itself like it's free of politics like this analytical approach that, like those equations, don't have any politics inside. The equations are full of politics inside. It's just, they're, just, they're just hidden behind those equations, actually. When you assume a utility-maximizing person, and when you assume markets and all this, you're actually assuming a political position, and then turning around and claiming that I'm doing scientific, value-free value -free economics, and you are being political, this is, I mean, you, 
you can't say this thing. You, this, is, this is so wrong to claim this. But as I've said, in order to be able to discuss with the mainstream these issues, they need to have a certain level of intellectual depth. The conversation doesn't go anywhere. You hit a wall when you're trying to discuss with these people. You try to open this discussion and it just, just doesn't go anywhere. That's why the economic student's struggle is so important, so that the next generation of students and the lecturers are not like this at least, so that they can talk about philosophy of science. They have a few words to say about philosophy of science, at least, because at the moment, mainstream economists have, don't have a clue about philosophy of science, not a single clue. You say Kuhn, they look at your face. You like, say Lakatosh, they look at your face. It's like, who is that, actually? Is that an economist? Oh, no, that's philosophy, just leave it. That's, that's, the, that's the reaction you will get. That's exactly why I've told this to Antti, that I've stopped discussing with the mainstream. I've stopped it. I, I'm not going to waste my time anymore with this because this is an utter, an utter waste of time. It's nothing else. I, I prefer talking to my students rather than talking to them. Every minute I spend talking to my students is much more useful for the future than I spend talking to a mainstream economist, really. This is my honest perspective. And I'm being as honest as I can, and I've written this on my last blog posts as well. When I discuss with some mainstream people on the blog, I wrote this, and that's the final discussion I'm going to have, really. Because as I've said, we're not talking the same language. You're not talking the same language. The language is different. I understand fully what you're saying for that reason. And I'm not aware of the literature you've mentioned, unfortunately. That, that's, we can talk about that later, and you can enlighten me if you want about that. Yeah, I could add up yeah. still there. Uh, there was this I interesting point you had on how some uh, mainstream economists commented uh, Marx, and and, they, and that was of course uh, to say that that was a straw man, <laughs> was kind to somehow to uh, play down the, the kind of uh, uh, the stupidity of that comment. But uh, but I have a very similar. Um, uh, experience from Finland which uh, is which basically um it's not maybe that striking, but in some ways uh, it's uh, it's basically almost the same thing. Uh, there was a uh, was a um, uh, long, quite a long discussion in in Akateminen and Talous blog, the academic uh, economics blog, which is run by many Finnish Orthodox Finnish economists, and and there was a discussion about the uh, about in the comments section there about the relevance of post-Keynesian economics, and there is a one very uh, one particularly. Uh, say critical uh, person who is uh, working in the University of Helsinki and he was uh, using extremely harsh tone in criticizing post Keynesianism uh, extremely harsh and and not not academic tone very like saying that all these people they are ignorant they're stupid they don't understand anything and and stuff like that and then uh, we were I was trying to push that okay just come down and try to say what is the problem with post-Keynesian economics. This person has done that many times before and never he has not been explicating what, what, what is the prob problem there. But then he had, then he said one thing. He said that the problem is that you are using ISLM models. I was, oh my God, well, the whole post-Keynesian school is founded on criticizing ISLM models. That's the only idea of the whole school at the, at the, uh, when it was developed to criticize ISLM models. And this person was actually uh, like, uh, like somehow uh, trying to be, uh, or, or it, he, he had been, uh, uh, he had gotten into some kind of a very aggressive uh, mindset uh, only uh, because he really didn't know anything about post-Keynesianism, but sti still he had had a kind of a, a very aggressive attitude, but, but that attitude was o o only based on ignorance. And that was basically the same thing as with the, with the, with the Marxian example. Uh, ignorance feeds stupidity, I think. Okay, thank Last you. Uh, we have to end in a few minutes. So, Hongo uh, Bohia? And then after that, if you still want to say a few words, we only actually. have like uh, one minute left. Well, uh, can I tell you, I, you know, if I had encountered that same person, I would have also thought that it, this is very strange. It's, it's an, it's an anti-intellectual attitude, very much. The, obviously, you have to be a serious scholar, a scholar about these things and study them carefully. You have to know what you're talking about. Of course, you know, the, you know it is, of course, also true that the economics faculties will have to make choices about what you teach what you teach, you can teach everything, 
and, and you can also require students to read on outside the reading lists and outside the whatever the requirements for, for are. I mean, I, I did spend a lot of time reading other things, other things here. So, so that's, that's, that's clearly the case. So, uh, so that, that I think is very important. You've got to have an open mind. You've got to have go and, in a flexible, flexible sort of way. Try different approaches. Let's see which one is produ producing the, the, you know, the be best empirical and theoretical explanation using not so unrealistic assumptions. I'm afraid the new Keynesian, post-Keynesian assumptions are also very narrow, very unrealistic, if I can use that term. term. So, so, you know, all, you know, in some sense, in, in one so sense... So you're supporting the student movement. Yeah, you're, in, you're in just one said, sense, actually, that you want, you want all theories to be confronted I, I to want, empirical I wanted research. It, I wanted them to teach, but in a serious... That's exactly in, what in the, the students the want, the that's why in I'm saying. In a serious sort of matter, in yeah. a serious sort of matter, and, 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 and then don't just... Don't just talk about the straight, you know, let's talk about where the research is going. Talk about the recent work. Of course, you can do it in, in economics one. You can do it maybe finally undergraduates, you can do it. I, I did that in Cambridge a little bit. I could do it with finally undergraduates, more with graduate students. But you have to realize that, you know, this is a progressive. Let's go on. Let's, let, you know, can, there can are I research say challenges, about problems, this? work. One final yes. word about this I want to say. The problem with all this is that when you teach the economic students the Strawman versions from the first year, you're indoctrinating these people, actually. Because every student of mine, I ask this in the, in my, to my second years, to my third years, what happens when government prints money? Inflation, straight away. This is like, this is, these are proper indoctrinations because you take them in the first year, you tell them government spending is useless, wages are marginal products, blah, 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 blah. You've already indoctrinated young minds who are 18 years old and you start believing these things that you're teaching them. That's exactly why I agree, Strawman must not be taught. And I'm teaching this as well. I'm lecturing mainstream macro. I'm teaching that wages are equal to marginal product, but then I'm spending 45 minutes to criticize this idea and to, and to teach why this is entirely wrong. But I'm sure not everybody is doing this. I really hope everybody does this. That with that, I have no problem with teaching mainstream. I'm not, I'm not saying let's not teach mainstream. Let's teach mainstream, let's teach the other things next to them as well, decently, honestly, as you said. And that applies more to the heterodox people than so, so more to the mainstream people than to the heterodox I think people. It also applies to the heterodox. It does, but more in a Very more way. So. Uh, I can talk about from my personal experience that at least I can, the, the I can experience. Also tell the 1970s yes, yes, story. Yes, sure. I completely <laughs> agree. It applies to Marxists. Some Marxists don't want to see any any mainstream stuff in their universities. I agree with that, but that's true. Okay. So I'll stop here. I thank you very much for this lively debate <laughs> and. Uh, if I'm not too courageous, I would say that maybe also the students uh, calling for pluralistic uh, teaching in economics has had some support from also the Bank of Finland. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but some, maybe some. <laughs> okay, I, I thank you very much. I hope you have a nice evening. And uh, we have a video of this coming later on the website of uh, Sorsa Foundation. Okay. And uh, obviously, we need to organize another debate again. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, very, it was a very pleasant one. Thank you, Mark.